thank you all because I see you all already know about this first one. Yeah, uh, Pearlie Town of Ridgefield. We all need to keep masks that cover our mouth and nose inside the library. However, we understand if you feel you need a mask break, please feel free to just you know step outside for a few minutes if you need to do that. Um, with Dr. Amar's permission, tonight's event is being recorded and it will be available to watch on the library's YouTube channel. Um, restrooms are available across the hall. Uh, we're scheduled to go to about 8.30 tonight. Um, please take a moment. There's pink, uh, very short surveys found on your chair, if you don't mind, but at the end of the program, there's a collection box on that silver cart right outside the doors. And of course, we all cherish our First Amendment rights. Um, we ask everyone to be respectful of each other and to maintain civil discourse. Tonight's lecture is the start in the series, What Does the First Amendment Mean Today? Examining the text, history, and current state of the First Amendment. This series is part of a multi-year First Principles initiative created by the Ridgefield Library, the Ridgefield Historical Society, the League of Women Voters of Ridgefield, the Drum Hill Chapter of the DAR, and the Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center. For this fall, our partner organizations have worked to develop educational programs exploring the concepts embodied in the First Amendment from both a historical and contemporary perspective. Please be sure to pick up the flyer with more information on the upcoming programs in the series. Again, it's just right outside the door there. The First Amendment series is funded in part by a grant from the Connecticut Humanities, an independent nonprofit affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. CT Humanities is supported by state and federal matching funds, community foundations, and gifts from private sources. So that is more than enough for me, and I would like to introduce Mr. Todd Brewster, author, journalist, and lecturer, who we are very thankful to have serving as our scholarly advisor for the First Principles Initiative. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to see so many of you turning out uh, tonight. Um, and I'm delighted to be introducing my very good friend, Akhil Lamar, um, uh, who I've known for about 25 years, I think it is. Um, he, uh, he's, um, he warned me not to uh, go on too long about him tonight. Uh, he said he feared that like an overzealous waiter, I might raise expectations so high for the <laughs> evening meal that you go home feeling undernourished. <laughs> Uh, so indeed, I won't go on long about Akil or the pasta special. Um, but you also won't be disappointed. Uh, in fact, if you, you are actually in for a real treat tonight. Uh, Akil is one of the nation's great, great thinkers about the Constitution. He's demonstrated that both in his extensive, extensive writing and his long history as Sterling Professor at Yale Law School. At Yale, he has taught many who went on to become U.S. Senators, presidential candidates, and even Supreme Court Justices. Um, I won't go through the list because there's some he's proud of, and I'm sure there's some he's not very proud of. Um, in fact, the nation has, relied upon, uh, has always relied on the vigorous popular discussion of the First Amendment, um, and Akhil is one who has brought us uh, close to that uh, discussion. Um, take my word for it, when those in the halls of power want to understand our founding document, one of the people they turn to is Akhil Reed Amar. A couple of years ago, Akhil appeared here to great acclaim when he launched the library's First Principles series. Tonight, he opens the library series on the First Amendment, and if you find that most of his attention is on the causes regarding the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press, that will be because he just published a new book entitled The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation. It's the first of a two-volume project. The book demonstrates how the discussion of constitutional principles is not exclusive to the courts, or to the academy. <clears throat> the nation's always relied upon that vigorous, popular discussion. Akhil has brought some books with him tonight, and he'll be happy to sign them uh, for all who want to purchase a copy after the event. We'll also take questions at the end of the event as well. And I urge you all to come to the other First Amendment events coming up, including the one on October 10th, when Akhil will return and join me, Nadine Strozen, the former ACLU director, New York Times journalist Mike McIntyre and Richfield Library Director Brenda McKinley, whom you just met. And we'll engage in our own conversation about the words that made us. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited to introduce Akil Reed Amar. Thank you so much for inviting me back. This uh, space brings back memories. Memory, as some of you know um, personally, and, and anyone who's read Proust can also attest, is, is very spatial. You come to a, a place that you haven't been there for a long time, but all sorts of memories come flooding back the last time you were, you were in that space. And all sorts of warm memories are flooding back for me. And, and thank you. For this. this is an extraordinary institution. Especially grateful to my friend, uh, former student Todd, uh, for, for inviting me. Um, and and I think actually today's topic is also particularly apt because Todd is a preeminent journalist. He's taught me a lot about uh, the First Amendment and its relationship to constitutional law. And that's actually. Um, I apologize, this is a plug, um, but that's really at the, at the heart of the book that I just finished. Um, and that's what you're here to, to, to talk about. And, and uh, I'll go on for a bit, but but First Amendment ultimately is about discourse, conversation, so I'm going to try to leave lots of time for us to discuss things. Um, so what is the relationship between or what we call the First Amendment and the Constitution more broadly. Uh, the book is called The Words That Made Us, and it's almost a pun. Um, it's the words that made the U.S. us. Um, that's a good one. Great. Sure. Great. Um, and um, so, us. We, as in we, the people. Who are we? What, what made us? Here's a central claim of mine. We Americans have only certain things in common, not everything. Um, we don't have race in common. We are a famously uh, a people of, of many races and ethnicities. We don't have religion in common, and we never have. Um, from the beginning, there was great religious diversity, even when it was largely within Christendom. Uh, you got Puritans uh, here in New England, Congregationalists, um, uh, free thinkers in Rhode Island, uh, 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 Anglicans and uh, Episcopalians and, and Baptists in uh, Virginia, Quakers in Pennsylvania. Uh, not even including all the, the new sects. I'm trying to pronounce that word. It's very hard with an S. It's sects. It doesn't come out right. S-E-C-T-S. Um, yes, what did you, what did Professor Amar talk about? He, he just talked all about sex. Um, so, um, uh, uh, but um, that not even counting some of the new American um, uh, denominations that are, that are emerging, Methodists, uh, shakers um, uh, and the like. So, religious diversity, massive, racial and ethnic diversity. You, you, you've got um, uh, Germans and Dutch and Swedes in, in uh, uh, New York, it used to be called New Amsterdam. Um, uh, folks from a certain part of England come to <clears throat> New England, that's why it's called uh, New England, folks from a very different part of the old world. Uh, uh, populate uh, the coastal south. You got the Scotch Irish and, and Appalachia. So, from the beginning, not ethnicity, not race, not religion, not even language. And from the beginning, I mean, it's not just that today not everyone is a native English speaker, it's that at the time of the founding, a third of uh, Pennsylvanians actually speak German as their first language. Okay. Um, well, did we all come at the, roughly the same time? No. Some, my, my wife is an immigrant, and some of you may descend from the Mayflower. Um, and some of our ancestors came over um, in chains, uh, and some came with bullets in their hands. So, so ooh, that's a complication now, isn't it? Uh, different times and different um, ways of, of uh, these families coming to us. So what is it? 
that makes us us, makes us a we. Well, we politically, do we agree? No. Okay. Um, not quite. On um, lots of things. Geographically, huge variations. And culturally, um, um, even uh, in, in terms of climate, we're warm weather and cold weather people, we're coastal people and, uh, and hinterland people, we're city folk and, and country mice. Okay, so my claim is what we have in common is our Constitution. Um, and the story that underlying that Constitution and closely related documents like the Declaration of Independence or the Federalist Papers. Um, this is a volume that takes you, the reader, from 1760 to 1840. The words that made us America's Constitutional Conversation 1760 to 1840. Volume 2 will take you, um, the next 80 year period four score, so to speak. Um, and Lincoln, of course, as I mentioned, four score is going to be at the, the apex. So that's going to be called The Words That Made Us Equal. And it's going to be about women's suffrage and black equality. Um, and um, the Native American experience will also feature prominently in, in that one. Um, volume three will eventually take the story for The Words That Made Us Modern, 1920 to 2000. Um, but, but yes, what we have in common is George Washington and Abe Lincoln. And that's true for my wife, who arrived here um, uh, in her 20s, you see. But, but she can affiliate, and does, um, because she hears me talk about them all the time, um, with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, um, and this constitutional story. Okay, so what does that, so that's what we have in common. It, and it begins that way, we, the people of the United States. And what's that preamble all about? Well, when you read it, it's not, it doesn't just tell you the why. We do certain things for certain purposes, to form a more perfect union, for common defense, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Um, but not just the why, but it's actually telling you something else. It's, the preamble is a deed, it's a doing. Let me take out all the extraneous words. You know, they used to joke, you know, since uh, we're, on, <coughs> we're marking the 20th anniversary, very somber moment in American history, 9-11, it was joked um, uh, 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 frequently about uh, Rudy Giuliani, um, back when he was um, a little bit more credible, um, that when he was running for president, every campaign speech of his had a, a nine of her of 9-11. Um, let me take you to the preamble and just tell the, nine, uh, the noun, the verb, and the, and the direct object. We, the people of the United States, da, 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 do, we're doing a certain thing, ordain and establish, that's the direct question, this Constitution. We ordain this Constitution. That's what the preamble says. We actually did something. We voted on it. Up and down the continent. <clears throat> the Constitution was put to a vote. Nothing like that had ever happened in world history. I'll say that again. World history, this is the big bang of world history. This is the hinge of human history, whether you know people recognize it or not. Here's the history of the world before that moment. <clears throat> Basically, um, most people in most places, um, uh, in most eras, are um, told what to do. Um, and they don't have anything remotely approaching self-government. The history of the world, almost everywhere, almost always, until 17, until the American Revolution, is a history of kings, emperors, czars, sultans, Mughal lords, tribal chieftains, thugs all. Kim Jong-un, Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, uh, Benito Mussolini, um, uh, uh, Ho, Mao, and their ilk. Okay, that's actually what the world is. Yes, there were a few places that made democracy work for a little bit. The glory of Heracle in Athens five centuries before Christ under the Christian constitution. And the Roman Republic before it collapsed and it degenerated into an empire uh, run by Emperor Caesars. Later, we called Sars, Kaisers. 
Excuse me. That's the work. And even the places that are somewhat democratic never put their way of life, their polit their polite, their constitutions to a popular vote. Athens never did that, Rome never did that. The British are somewhat self-governing, although they have a king that no one voted for, and a house of lords that no one voted for. Um, but they're somewhat self-governing in 1787. Uh, they've got uh, um, elections to some degree, um, although only one eight people probably is eligible to vote. Um, eight males, probably lower than that, actually. Um, um, but they have jury trials and, and some elections. The, the Swiss are to some extent self-governing, but no one lives in Swiss, um, they, they, they have more sheep and goats, and they have human beings, and they don't have cities and banks, and so, so no one's interested in them. That's it. And then we, the people in the United States, in actual fact, did it, ordained this constitution. We voted for we, uh, up and down the continent, the whole freaking continent, and the world will never be the same. That's the big bang of human history. That changes everything, because now, more than half the people on the planet, the population land mass, govern themselves. On an American constitutional model, plus or minus, we've written constitution, and uh, let's just take India. My parents are still alive, they're in their 90s. When they were born, India's not self-governing. There's a king halfway across the world telling them what to do, and no one voted for him. And a parliament halfway across the world telling them what to do, and no one voted for them, no one in India. And now, a billion, with a B, that would be a thousand millions. A billion people govern themselves. It's not perfect. It's not perfect here, truth be told. But they govern themselves with a written constitution, free and fair elections, plus or minus, um, multiple parties alternating power, um, religious um, freedom to some extent, a lot of ethnic and, and linguistic variation, on the American constitutional model. That's a billion people. That's, um, uh, and, and, and we could talk about Japan, and we could talk about um, uh, West Germany, we could talk about France. At the time of the American Constitution, France is an absolutist monarchy. And today it's a pretty good republic. It's not as impressive as California, and which is having its problems. It's not. They don't treat their Muslims as well as California treats its ethnic minorities. And I grew up in California, so it's not. And, and don't tell this to a French person, but the counterpart to France is not the United States, it's California. Okay? Um, don't tell a Canadian this either, but California could kick their ass in a war. Um, we've got, you know, in California, better, a higher GDP, higher GDP per capita, much more impressive world-class universities and, 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 and technology. So, so how does that happen? It happened because we, the people of the United States, put the thing to a vote. And the world would never be the same. That's the big bang of human history. Almost no democracy, and now two-thirds of the planet or half the planet. Wow. But here's then, but you say, well, okay, he's kind of going on a bit, although what I just told you is a very big idea. But what's the connection between that and what Todd Brewster said he was going to talk about, which is the First Amendment? We didn't just vote. We talked about the thing endlessly for a year, up and down the continent. We conversed America's constitutional conversation. It didn't begin then. Actually, um, my, my, my book starts in 1760, so the, the project was already fairly mature by 1787, where for an entire year, an entire continent talked with each other about how they and their posterity were to be governed, took a vote, the, loop, the winners won, I'm, I'm on the winner's side, I'm, I'm a feminist, I'm, I'm a George Washington man, and the losers because they had their say, did not storm the capital. You see, they accepted the legitimacy of that outcome because they were heard, they spoke, it was fair. And their ideas were taken seriously. You know what we call their ideas? The First Amendment. The Bill of Rights. Because the people who were opposed to the Constitution, the first thing they said, okay, why are we meeting right now? Because this is Constitution Week. This is Constitution Month because in September, mid-September, 1787, the delegates at the Philadelphia Convention, presided over by George Washington, signed a document, it's a mere proposal, make it public, 
it, on September 17th, in fact, and, and that's when the year begins, when the people actually are going to decide whether they're for or against it. That's why we're meeting now, because this is Constitution Week. Um, and we've been taught to revere the folks of Philadelphia, and I really respect them. Um, and if you go to Philadelphia, please visit the National Constitution Center. The pres it's, pres uh, it's present, it's one of my favorite students of all time, uh, Jeff. Rosen, Todd Brewster is another one of my favorite students of all time, of course. Um, and he's right, not all the four senators who were my students are my favorite students of all time, but, but um, we can talk about that offline. Um, so when you go to, if you go to Philadelphia, go to the National Constitution Center, I actually helped create it. It didn't exist you know, when, when I started teaching constitutional, and I'm very proud of it, because I'm very proud of the Constitution, and I want you, my fellow Americans, to share in that. But here's the thing, great as those delegates were at Philadelphia, they were just a small group of people meeting in a room one-third the size of this room, probably one-quarter the size of this room. Um, Fifty-five people in all, 39 signed their names to it, um, and that didn't change the world, because the history of the world, in the history of the world, there, there are elites who meet behind closed doors and have interesting ideas. What changed the world is they put thing to a vote, as they said, and ordinary people got to talk about it. And the first thing they say, the Constitution's crowdsourced, you see, is, hey, dudes, you forgot the rights. There's no Bill of Rights in this document. And they did forget it. It was a mistake. It was a big mistake. It almost doomed the project, frankly. And you say, well, how could these smart people make such a big mistake? Because they wanted to go home. They were tired. That's, that's, my, that's actually my view of what happened, in fact. Because they, they make a whole bunch of arguments that don't make any sense, and eventually they change their mind. Because they have to, because people, people keep pushing them. Ordinary people. Not a, they're not as smart, maybe, as James Madison, or, or Alexander Hamilton, or George Washington. But there are a lot of them. And if you're a small-D Democrat, and I am, and I hope many of you are, you think there's a wisdom in what a lot of people think. Wisdom of the crowds. Deep wisdom. Um, so, where do we get this thing called the First Amendment? We get it from the very process by which the people adopted the Constitution. We get it from the preamble. We, the people, ordained the Constitution, and in the process of ordaining it, people said, we want some amendments, and amendments that protect, among other things, speech, press, petition, assembly, free exercise, and non-establishment. So that's where we get it. What word appears in more of what we call the Bill of Rights than any other phrase? The phrase is the people. The right? the people to petition and assemble in the First Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment. Yeah, a Yale Law professor just talked to you about the Second Amendment. Um, the uh, right of the people to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures in the Fourth Amendment, the rights retained by the people, um, reserved to the people of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Five different references. The people, the people, the people, the people, the people, because it's coming from the people, from the preamble process, from this epic national conversation. And let me tell you one other thing about this. See, see how it's short? Why is it short? Why is it short? Not so judges can make jump up. That's not why it's short. It's short. Because in 1787, the people in Philadelphia wanted to write something that could and did appear in every newspaper in America that week. And you could read it start to finish because there was extraordinary high literacy rates in America. It's a Protestant country to a very great extent. People wanted to be able to read their Bible because um, they believed in Sola Scriptura, uh, any of them. Um, uh, so, Luther and Gutenberg are connected because Martin Luther wants you to read your Bible and you can't do that without actually a printing press that's printed actually in the vernacular, and uh, the Bible printed in the vernacular. Um, okay, so massive literacy. This is why I'm so honored uh, that, that Todd is introducing me because he's a great journalist and this book is all about the connection between newspapers in particular, journalism, um, and our constitutional project. It's short so that it could appear, start to finish in newspapers, and it did all up and down the continent. People read the thing. 
from start to finish. When was the last time you read your constitution? And then very grateful you came out today because no, you know, everyone else is just having fun. You know, but, but, um, so, so, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, I'm, I'm calling you out. But, here's, the, the fundamental problem is, we won't hang together. Republics died. Rome fell. Um, uh, ancient Athens um, collapsed uh, under the, the Periclean Constitution. Unless we actually sustain the project, and we have to sustain it by actually knowing it, and what happened before, and why, and reading the Constitution, it was written so that we would read it, and reread it, and we could amend it, and did. Ten times right off the bat. Um, um, and um, so I'm being honest with you, most people today don't do that. They, they don't even know who the presidents are, um, have been, and you can't discharge your, there is freedom of speech, I'm going to get around to talking about it. But there, freedom of speech is part of a larger system of responsibilities as well as rights. I believe there's not just the freedom of speech, but there's a duty to listen. And I spend, and even when that's unpleasant, I actually every day um, check out Fox and uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Three very different perspectives on things, and those aren't the only ones. Um, but um, uh, people up and down the continent in 1787 to 88, the hinge of human history, actually talk to each other, persuade each other on some things, listen to each other. The minority, even when they lost, said, "Well, you actually did listen to us," and and their best ideas become the Bill of Rights, don't you see? So people really were listening and changing their mind on stuff. So. Um, every four years, we pick a, a president. You might think constitutional law is only is about courts. It's not. Article 3 is third out of three. Um, but even if it were about courts, presidents pick justices and people pick presidents. Every four years, we're the hiring committee. We, the people of the United States. And you can't do your job as the hiring committee unless you know about the past presidents, and who's done that job well and not well, and what's the job description and all the rest. So, um, uh, I could walk out today and have an intelligent conversation with two-thirds of the people I meet about Derek Jeter, and how he compares to the greats, um, the great shortstops you know, of all time, the great Yankees of all time. I'm a Red Sox fan, but um, <laughs> we'll just put that to one side. Um, um, but um, people could actually talk about how Tom Brady compares to Joe Montana um, or Peyton Manning or Bart Starr, you know, uh, or Y.A. Tittle or whatever. And yet they actually don't understand what the presidency is all about, who the past presidents have been, or, or what the job description is, who's done it well and not. That's how the public side. Okay? Um, so, and it's what we have in common, because I told you, it's not race, it's not religion, it's not ethnicity, it's not even language. It's this, and it's short. And I want you to know it backwards and forwards and sideways, um, in part because that's my obsession, I admit it. Mm -hmm. but, but without that, there's no we. Um, there's so many things that you don't have to know. You don't have to be a great carpenter, you can just go on Craigslist and find someone to to build you a bookcase, um, or um, to paint your house, or to fix your, 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 your plumbing. But only you can have to decide for yourself every four years who to vote for. You can't have other people do that for you. And um, so that's what events like this are all about, books like the one that I'm, I'm implicitly plugging. Um, uh, maybe not so implicitly, um, are all about. Now let me tell you a little bit more about the First Amendment in particular, and then open up our conversation. So there's six things in it. Um, you, you know, you might say, well, why is it first? Because it's most important. The only problem is it was actually originally third on the list. The first two didn't get ratified. So it's kind of accidental that it's first. Um, but it's poetic that it's first, because conceptually it is first. Philosophically, logically, you can't have 
self-governing. You can't have a We the People project without robust, uninhibited, wide open political story too late. I started the story with Madison in the first Congress, and I didn't start the story with the ratification of the Constitution, where people said, dude, you forgot the rights. I didn't start the story even earlier with Benjamin Franklin in 1754, and cartoons, and the newspaper culture, and all the rest. So, um, but in a nutshell, in, um, uh, do, do people, in, in just in your experience, I, I mean, I, I, and Alexander Hamilton is, you know, I, the, his spirit, I think, would like this book. He, he's really much more the hero of the book than, let's say, Thomas Jefferson. And if you had met me at age 20, I would have told you, oh, if I'm ever lucky enough to have a son, I'm going to name him Jefferson. Uh, so I've changed my mind on Jefferson. He's uh, become, I, I esteem him less um, in various ways. And I always said, oh, that Alexander Hamilton, he just, you know, favors the rich people or something. And I, and I changed my mind about him. So I'm really admiring of Hamilton. Um, uh, he's a total genius and low born. And, and the book is dedicated to six people, one of whom is Lynn Miranda, one of whom is Lynn's spouse, Vanessa Nadal, one of whom is Ron Chernow. Right. That said, in your experience, do people like admitting they made a mistake? <laughs> no, they don't. They made a whopping mistake at Philadelphia. It almost cost them everything, and it takes them a long time to actually admit they made a mistake to pivot. Because if Hamilton is right in 84, then we the people are nitwits because we kept insisting on a Bill of Rights. And James Madison was a nitwit when he changed his mind. And George Washington was a nitwit when he actually, in his first inaugural address, said, I think we should think about a Bill of Rights. And state after states would be nitwits because they have Bills of Rights. So, what I say, and you know, it's so simple in a way, um, mm -hmm. that, that they made a mistake at Philadelphia. It was the end, and they were hot, and homesick. When I'm really being very candid, I say they were hot home courting and homesick. They wanted to go home to their wives and mistresses, not necessarily that order. And, um, and George Mason says, we need a Bill of Rights. He actually crafted the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And they're thinking, I can see the wheels turning. Mason is a pain in the butt. And he says this can be quick, but this is another two weeks now. Um, and I want to go home. So they made a mistake. Immediately, up and down the kind of people said, you made a mistake, you made a mistake, you made a mistake. Um, and Hamilton doesn't make the pivot because he doesn't like admitting that he made a mistake. Okay? So they say, you know, bills, so it, it, it's like, um, is it any hall where they say, oh, the food is horrible in such small portions? <laughs> okay, you know, bills of rights are bad, and besides, we have one in the Constitution. Wait a minute, those two don't add up, okay? Um, bills of rights aren't necessary in the Republic. Well, then why do states have them, you see? The arguments that actually are made in 84 aren't so good. And if they were good, why do they lose? If most people most of the time aren't stupid, they do lose out. I did tell that story in my book, The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, 1988. I promise you I tell the new one. And it's one of the things I'm kind of proud of, because I actually have a much better and more human answer thing. Small people, group of people in the room, they made a mistake. It took them a long time to admit they made a mistake, but in, in the end, they did. And they said, fine, if you'll vote for the Constitution, we'll take seriously the Bill of Rights. And listening to each other at the end, it takes a long time because people don't want to admit they made mistakes. I think maybe we can, oh, I think maybe we can get one more question and then we'll okay. get Dr. Which is a, back to Which is a very polite way of saying, don't, that. Right, don't filibuster him okay, yeah, so no, I'm no, sorry, no. some of my answers were a little long. We'll, we'll get him back to that table for that book. <laughs> oh, um, you mentioned earlier that you thought George Washington was really the father yes. of the Constitution. I was yes. wondering if you could explain why. Absolutely, thank you for that. So, um, no one's ever heard of James Madison. He's five foot four. I have this issue about height. You know, people like Todd, you know, they just sort of stride into the room. And, okay, he's a nobody from nowhere. And 
almost every new idea that he proposes at Philadelphia loses. Who's George Washington? He is, alongside Benjamin Franklin, the most famous American in the world. And Ben Franklin's too old. Why? Because he had, he was the Supreme Allied Commander who, who, who beat the British seven years, eight years of a long hard reset, actually eight, really, 1775 to uh, uh, 83. He leaves his farm for no pay, and for eight years he's away from hearth and home defending American liberty, getting his ass kicked. Almost every day of those eight years, he has five good days in eight years, you know. And some of those good days are just surviving, getting off uh, um, Long Island um, in the Battle of Brooklyn, um, evacuating Manhattan. Uh, so some nice um, uh, morale-boosting skirmishes in Trenton and, um, uh, and, and Princeton, um, uh, a draw at Monmouth, and then a North Town. That's it, you know. He, he, uh, so, he has the only army on the continent after beating the British, finally, against all odds, you know, just as a service to, to America, not for profit. Mm -hmm. And he has the only army on the continent, and he disbands it and goes to his farm. And the world had never seen anything like that. George III was asked, he said, he said I hear, someone says, I hear Washington's going to disband his army. George III says, if he does that, he'll be the greatest man in the world, you see. Because Caesar took that army and made himself Emperor or Augustus. And, 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 um, uh, and Cromwell names himself War Protector in the 1640s. And William, uh, famously in 1066, you know, makes himself you know, a, a king, William the Conqueror. Um, and Napoleon's going to grab the crown from the Pope's hands and put it on his own head within you know, the next um, uh, uh, a few years. And George Washington gives up the army and walks away from all power. Wow. Now America, and this is the story I tell in the book, is, is in trouble. Um, and, and he promises never to come back, but, but a term of thing, his country needs him, so at the expense of his own reputation, he goes to Philadelphia. And that's, that's why it's credible. No one's ever heard of James Madison. The only person they've heard of is Ben Franklin, who's too old, but he's there too. George Washington, He's coming out of retirement to save America again. That's the news everywhere. And he shows up and he's unanimously selected the president of the convention, as in the president of the United States. It's the same word because it's the, the presidency is designed for him. There are only 55 people all told in Philadelphia. Th 39 of them signed the Constitution. They're not all there together. Only 12 states. Two thirds of them fought the American Revolution. Half of them fought in Washington's army. Five people from five different states, only 12 states, only 39 people sent it. From five different states, five people are actually Washington's aides de camp. New York's Alexander Hamilton, Maryland's Thomas Mifflin, Virginia's Edmund Randolph, South Carolina's um, uh, Charles Pinckney, and um, uh, Maryland's um, uh, uh, McKinley. Anything that George Washington wants, he gets. Okay, he doesn't even have to say anything. He's the strong silent type. The key to the Constitution is this immensely powerful presidency, far more powerful than any governor of the continent. Four-year term, re-electable, no term limits, veto pen, pardon pen, commander in chief of the entire all the forces on the continent, the ability to hire and fire people at, at, at will, and an executive branch to name all Supreme Court justices and lower court judges. It's a massively powerful presidency. That's the new thing in the Constitution. It's great for George Washington. Hamilton, uh, Madison actually says before the convention, I don't even know what executive power looks like. And he doesn't. And even as president, he lets the captain burn to the ground. He's not on the rush more, you see. Um, okay. Now, people vote for the Constitution because George Washington is for it. He counts for more than the Federalist Papers times five. Okay? That's why they vote for the Constitution, because they're hoping that he will be the first president, and he's unanimously elected president of the United States. Unanimously, every elected vote for him, and unanimously re-elected president of the United States. And he's the one in his inaugural address that says, actually, we should have a bill of rights, we should listen to the people who voted against the thing, because they're Americans too, and we need to bring them on board. And no one else is remotely as equivalent. They all look up to him, and he is an amazing judge of talent, and he picks Alexander Hamilton on his right, and. 
Thomas Jefferson is left. And you don't know, but my book will explain to you, the Constitution <laughs> is a geostrategic document. There's no Constitution unless we can beat the Brits. And the Spanish and the French do not count on the French. Never count on the French. They do not love you. They love the French. And they helped you this time around, but they fought against you in the French and Indian War and do not count on them next time around. And George Washington understands that there is no Constitution unless you actually have national security. Why is America free? And then he walks away again. And no one's remotely his equivalent. And it's hard to see him because he's such a silent person. I end this whole thing by reminding us of the 20th anniversary remark. If you ask yourself, why is America free? Most of the answers you were told are wrong. I was taught the same things and they're wrong. But if you read my book, you will longer realize so. I'm, I'm being really serious about this because you guys know more about baseball and football and who the hell cares than you actually know about the most important things in the world. Like well, how does liberty you know, uh, exist and, and what makes the United States United States? Here's why the United States is why people in America, white people, they haven't talked to us very, very much, are free. Because for the first 150 years in America, there's no standing army in peacetime. That's why you're free. Because the rest of the world are kings, emperors, are satans, little lords, tribal chieftains, thugs, all who use their, 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 their bully boys to repress people. They have land borders with each other and they kill each other and their own people. And George Washington disbands the army. You see, he doesn't try to create a new one. And there's no standing army in peace. And today, America has a vast military industrial and carceral complex, the likes of which have never before been seen in human history. And that's a very different in a world with a bigger threat to freedom. Before 9-11, that's why it's 25th verse, the last time foreigners draw blood, the heartland of America is the War of 1812, which is the Revolutionary War we visited. That's why we're free. Okay? Um, in World War II, some of you, maybe some of you may have, uh, uh, if you didn't live through it, you, you, your parents, all of our parents, surely did. 30 million Soviets die. Dresden is firebombed. Berlin is reduced to rubble. Paris and France fall. Bombs rain over Britain. Major cities in Japan are incinerated. And here it is only Pearl Harbor, which is halfway around the freaking planet from where we sit today. And that's because of these massive moats called the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean and George Washington's geostrategic vision. You think the Federalist 10 is important? No one fucking reads the Federalist 10. Oh, see, I dropped it up on you. I'm excited. And you're always going to. And this is now recorded. Oh my god, my mom is going to be so disappointed with me. But no one reads the Federalist 10. No one. If you had a good argument for why people should ratify the Constitution, would you wait to get to temp op ed to make it? Of course you wouldn't. The reasons for the Constitution are Washington and Hamilton's reasons. They're geostrategic reasons. The Constitution is created in the, in, in the image of George Washington, a strong executive and a strong national security document for common defense. That's what it's all about, and it's not the story we were told. And it's fundamentally one in which strong defense, but we actually don't want to have an army. We want to have a navy that can protect us. The way that Britain, you see, is free because it's a it's an island nation. We want to be an island nation, which is why Trump, and we keep wanting to go back to the womb. It's in our DNA. We want to have a wall. We want to have Star Wars, because we begin in a Washingtonian fashion to try to create an island nation separated from all the monsters across the planet. Okay? And today, does that work? The rest of the world is democratic. I told you much of it in a way that wasn't before. Our moats no longer protect us. There are pandemic viruses and climate change and international terrorism and um, the nuclear proliferation. So, so you need to understand how Washington's vision was brilliant for his time, but things have changed. We have a massive military industrial complex. Now we have to think about liberty and our constitution in very different ways. And you won't see any of that unless you actually understand it's Washington's constitution. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Dr. Amar. That was a wonderful evening, and um, Dr. Amar will be available in the back corner if you're interested. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Todd. And uh, thank we you, look Todd. forward to October 10th. As Todd mentioned, uh, Professor Amar will be back um, along with other panelists, and uh, we hope to see you there. We have a flyer for all the um, programs in the series. If I could just put in, first one, a word of thanks to Todd and to all of you, but also. Nadine Strassen is one of my best friends in the world. She's amazing. Come to hear her. You will not be disappointed. Absolutely.